All right, school is in session. So take your seats and turn up the volume. volume. It's time for the smartest fishing show on the internet. This is the show that dives into everything fishing from tactics and gear to policy and product. Here he is, the fishing professor, Professor Sid Dobrin. So stick around, you might learn something. I was once out strolling one very hot summer's day when I thought I'd lay myself down to rest in a big field of tall grass. I laid there in the sun and felt it caressing my face. And as I fell asleep and dreamed, I dreamed I was the star of the Inventive Fishing Fishing Professor Rodcast. And it turns out I am. Hey, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Rodcast. I am Sid Dobrin, the Fishing Professor, and your guide on this week's charter into the Hall of the Mountain King, where we're going to talk about fishing and whiskey and more fishing. And this week, we have got a new friend in the inshore offshore studio because we have got award-winning outdoor writer Steve Griffin with us, and we're going to talk ice fishing and sturgeon fishing and even more fishing. And after Griffin and I spill the wine, I'm going to pour a few fingers of Jack Daniels rye, and I'll let you know what I think about this rye endeavor from that great American distillery, Jack Daniels. Hey, I'm also going to be counting down my favorite spinning rods designed for inshore fishing. Hey, speaking of spinning rods, did you know that spinning reels, or what were first known as fixed spool reels, were invented by English textile magnate Holden Illingworth, who filed the first patent for them in 1905? Now, I should note that the level wine predates the spinning reel by nine years because William Shakespeare, the other one, not the bard, this is the one from Kalamazoo, Michigan, well, he devised the level wine about nine years before the spinning reel. But when Illingworth developed the fixed spool or spinning reel, he revolutionized fishing because these new reels increased casting distances because the line faced much less resistance coming off the spool than the level wind reel, which had to pull the line enough to turn the spool. Now, it wasn't until after World War II, however, that spinning reels came to the U.S. when a wealthy American sportsman named Bache Brown traveled to France, learned how to make spinning reels, developed his own spinning reel, which by the way, he named after himself. And then he brought the idea back to the States and started making them. He sold his first fishing reel company to Lionel. Yes, the toy train company back in 1947. Now Lionel marketed the reels under the name Airex, A-I-R-E-X. Lionel then bought another newer reel called the Beachcomber, which was a smaller reel that weighed in at 16 ounces and had a line capacity of 250 yards of 15 pound test mono now those early european fixed spools used a half bale design but the beachcomber introduced the full bale concept and changed the entire industry now i should say too that the development of the spinning reel also created a shift in the fishing line industry because these new reels facilitated the need for new lines with smaller diameters and companies started experimenting with new materials from which to make thinner lines like monofilament lines so there you have it a quick history lesson about spinning reels even though this top t- this week's top 10 list looks at spinning rods for inshore application and let me tell you I am really glad to be getting into this week's episode. It's going to be a good one, and frankly, I could use it. It has been a rough week since I spoke with you last. You know, one of those weeks where nothing goes your way, I had one of those weeks this week, and I don't mean to unload my burdens on you, my listening crew, but it was a bad week. I really thought I was losing my mind this week, thought I was going to have one of those mental breakdowns you read so much about. I mean, I was down really down out of my mind. So I did the right thing and I scheduled an appointment with my shrink, mental health and all of that. But see, the thing is, I was so out of my mind this week that I went to the shrink and instead of getting dressed, I wrapped myself in saran wrap and cellophane. And when I walked into the psychiatrist's office, he looked at me and he said, clearly I can see your nuts. Clearly I can see your nuts. My humor is lost on you people. Oh, and speaking of cellophane, and for no reason other than it just popped into my mind, in the 2002 Rob Marshall film Chicago, when John C. Riley, who plays Amos Hart, sings and dances to Mr. Cellophane, well, that was flat out brilliant. Cellophane, Mr. Cellophane, should have been my name, Mr. Cellophane. 
fame because you can look right through me, walk right by me, and never know I'm there. But hey, I am here, and my name is Sid Dobrin, the fishing professor. Hey, welcome to the Rodcast. Let's get casting. All right, my listening crew, we are going to have some fun now. I am thrilled to have Steve Griffin in the inshore offshore digital studio today. Steve is an award-winning outdoor writer and photographer who writes for a number of magazines and newspapers about outdoor subjects like hunting, travel, camping, boating, kayaking, and natural history. And of course, he wouldn't be on the show if he didn't write about fishing, so we're going to talk fishing today. Interestingly, too, Steve writes for and designs museum exhibits as well, and he's taught magazine and feature writing courses at the university level also. He's the author or co-author of nine nonfiction books about outdoor subjects, and five of these, interestingly, and certainly interesting to me because I'm always interested in such things, five of them are children's titles. He's been writing outdoor features and articles for about 48 years now, and in 2019, the Outdoor Writers Association of America honored him with the first place award for best humor writing in a newspaper, and in 2010, that same organization honored him with a first place win for the best outdoor-related essay for a magazine. Likewise, in 2014, he won the Great Lakes Outdoor Writers Association first place award for black and white photography. And he has won numerous other awards for his writing and photography from the Outdoor Writers Association of America, the Great Lakes Outdoor Writers Association, and the Michigan Outdoor Writers Association. So, while I am honored to have such an esteemed outdoor writer on the show, I do have to tell you that the real reason, or at least the other reason I asked Steve to join me on the show today, is that recently he and I had the shared experience of spending two days in a fishing hut on the ice at Lake of the Woods, ice fishing for walleye, saugers, and a few other species that were new to me. And when you fish with somebody and realize you kind of like the person, it seems reasonable to invite them to be a guest on your podcast, especially when they happen to be an esteemed fishing writer. So, Steve, or now I have to ask, have I graduated to the level of calling you Griff? Absolutely. Uh, When I met my wife, her roommate was going with a Steve Griffin from another town in Michigan. And so she began, began calling me Griff. The only time she calls me Steve, it's when she calls me Steve and Arthur. And then I've done something very wrong. She's an elementary teacher. So she follows that by saying, oh, we've made bad choices, haven't we? So that's when I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> oh, Th- I, thanks I, for the for the, the wonderful introduction. Sid. Oh, th- glad you're here. <laughs> um, and uh, I would hear that uh, bad choice thing too often. Uh, that, would, that would be a regular commentary in my conversation. So yeah. So, hey, I know we're going to get around to talking about our ice adventure, um, but I want to kick this off as I do with all the guests on the show and ask you about your fishing and outdoor origins. How did you get into fishing, hunting, and how did those things lead you to this career as an outdoor writer? Oh, that's kind of a long story. I grew up uh, getting pushed off my grandma and grandpa's dock, bluegill fishing with my cousins, and, and then fishing for smallmouth bass with with my dad. Well, our family didn't have really accomplished fishermen or anglers, as we call them now, uh, but we had lots of people who loved to be outdoors. And so I came by that pretty naturally. Uh, Fast forward, I was at the University of of Michigan uh, working on a a degree in English with hopes of going to law school. My last semester was a program called the New England Literature Program, where we went out to New Hampshire and ran around the White Mountains and and fished and uh, and wrote in journals and stuff for six weeks. So I got used to translating my outdoor experiences into into words. Kind of fell in love with that. And before I got a chance to go to law school, uh, I called the local sports editor of the newspaper and said, "Do you ever buy outdoor freelance outdoor material?" Without bothering to tell him that I had never written any freelance outdoor material, uh, he jumped on it. I started doing a story a week, and uh, forty eight years later, I'm still. Uh, waiting to go to law school, but I'm sure I've just had a lot of fun. Uh, more, I think the the as much as I enjoy the fishing, I love the writing. I love getting up each day and and playing with words and trying to get them to do just just what I want. Uh, that that seems more successful than trying to get trout and bass and salmon to do just what I want. So it's it's good that my uh, my acclamations are in that direction. Yeah, I think I wrote once that I can never figure out which is more elusive, words or fish. Uh, that, that's a tough one. I think we have a little bit more control over words. Uh, 
uh, because the fish have a personality of their own. Although there are mornings when I think the words have a, a malicious personality of their own too, when, when they just don't work. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, so you mentioned in that, that brief overview of your origin, the word um, bluegill. And I want to start off small here today. And back in June of 2022, you wrote an article for the Midland Daily News, which uh, serves Midland County, Michigan, which is just a short hop to Saginaw Bay of Lake Huron. But you wrote an article called, We Should Be Talking More About Bluegills. So let's talk about bluegills. And as a professorial moment, I do want to point out that generally speaking, bluegills occur naturally in the U.S. east of the Rocky Mountains. But that's just their natural range. They've been introduced pretty much everywhere in North America to the extent that they really are kind of a ubiquitous fish. I mean, bluegill are the go-to fish that so many of us cut our teeth on as little kids. And now they've been introduced in the waters of Europe, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Asia, South America, uh, Australia, New Zealand. And I've heard that they're starting to turn up in the Chesapeake Bay because they're so hardy that they can tolerate levels of salinity. Now, in your article, you say that even with all the coho and Chinook salmon, steelhead and Atlantic salmon, smallmouth and largemouth bass, walleye and white bass, northern pike, catfish, drum, gar, the bluegill is still the most popular fish in Michigan, but nobody talks about it. So why should we be talking about the bluegill and not just in Michigan, but everywhere? Uh, <clears throat> because it is everywhere. It is uh, uh, wonderfully cooperative. It'll take a variety of, of offerings and tactics from the kid with the cane pole to the, the fly fisher uh, with a multi-hundred dollar setup. They're prolific. They're delicious. Uh, there's no shame in, in keeping a dozen uh, and, and take home and eat. And when you're introducing kids and other people to fishing, that whole concept of, of going from getting the gear ready to catching the fish to cleaning the fish to eating the fish and then sitting back and talking about it and laughing. That's a, a real satisfying circle for many of us. Uh, it's just just about the perfect fish. And by bluegill, uh, I think I probably mean sunfish uh, more generally, since you have bluegills and green sunfish and pumpkin seeds, and even smallmouth and largemouth bass are all part of the same family. Uh, so beginning fishermen quite often refer to them all as bluegills. And we generally go through a stage where we get real fussy about naming them. And then we come back to to where I am now, which is I don't care what they are as long as they're they're circular shaped and they bite, and I can take a couple home to eat, which we did just a few days ago through the ice here. Well, yeah, and I mean, speaking of words that we were talking about, they also get subsumed under that umbrella term of panfish, and then we throw in crappie and some others in there as well. So sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what's your favorite way to catch bluegill? Oh, you know, I could be a, a real smart aleck and say whatever I'm doing at the time, and that wouldn't be very far afield. I absolutely love catching bluegills through the ice. Uh, it's just, it's so intimate. It's not much equipment, and, and you're right over the hole, and you're paying attention to the least twitch of the line when the bluegill bites. Uh, I, I do just love that. What um? So you mentioned the, the light line and the tackle. What uh, Are you fishing bait? Or are you fishing arties? Uh, usually a, a combination, a, a bit of bait on a on a small jig, a two pound test line, uh, a rod a couple couple feet long at the most. Uh, it's it's pretty delicate. Uh, they'll yeah, fall for other methods, of course, but yeah, I've caught I've caught plenty of bluegill on small spinners, but I have <clears> to <throat> say that um, my favorite way to do them is hitting them with a popper on a light fly rod, like you alluded to. Sure, sure. I, I love doing that. Uh, I also like uh, in the open water fishing with ice tackle with a little jig and a grub under a small bobber. And I'll tell you, every time that bobber makes that, that little uh, staccato twitch, I laugh out loud and I can't help it. And, and when, I, when that doesn't happen, I'll know I'm, I'm nearing the end and it's time to, to, uh, to wrap up my affairs because it's just, it, it just fills my soul with glee. Well, that's kind of interesting, too, because as you're saying that, I'm getting giddy thinking about it. And it is, you know, we talked about bluegill as the perfect way to introduce kids to fishing or people new to fishing. And that's part of the experience that we want them to have is that excitement and how even now with as much as much fishing as you've done throughout your career, 
the fact that that one little fish can elicit that kind of a childlike response, that's pretty fantastic. I mean, my guess is you have a very different response to a big northern than you do to a bluegill. And there's probably a different kind of joy attached to that bluegill. Yeah, there is. And I think that joy is is direct wired. I'm not sure that that goes through the brain at all. When the, when I do get a strike from a pike, I think, okay, what am I going to do now? What do I have to do to, to get the fish in the boat? And, and if it's going my way, I think about, well, am I going to keep it or am I going to toss it back? None of that enters into bluegill fishing for me. It's just it's just direct wired to the, the pleasure centers of the brain. I wonder if there is a connection there to our, our Neanderthal brains that the bluegill signal is I'm going to eat. And I'm going to eat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, uh, we like success too. We like the challenge of not knowing if we're going to get the steelhead or the pike in, but, but the bluegill boom, we've, we've done it. And as you say, get the, get the grease hot. This is going to be fun. So aside from uh, artificials, uh, what is your favorite bluegill bait? Aside from artificial, I use wax worms a lot or what's called mousies. They're just small grubs, uh, just a, a, a morsel of food. The The new plastic baits have really taken hold, little artificial imitations of those. Uh, and I've had tremendous luck on those. The, the advantage of those is, is that there's always a little current, even in a frozen lake. And those little plastic tails will keep twitching when I'm not paying attention. So I don't have to impart action to, to draw the fish in. Uh, so I've switched over to those. Uh, I don't have a, a strong preference one over the other. A small grub-like bait, whether artificial or natural, uh, works really well for me. Well, I got to tell you, my favorite bluegill bait, not artificial, my go-to for bluegills has always been canned corn. And my freshwater tackle box has a can of corn, always has a can of corn, and either a can opener or make sure it's a pop top. Because when it comes to freshwater and panfish, whether it's bluegill or crappie or sunfish, bass and trout will also, they don't pass up a kernel of corn. Now that is totally brand new to me. And I'm going to test that out either tomorrow morning or Sunday morning when I take my six-year-old grandson out fishing. Excellent. Well, I want to hear the results of that because I, I am serious. When we find a little lake or a little pond and everybody's figuring out what to do, I pitch out a single corner, kernel of corn, and that's where I start getting the, the, the bluegill and the crappie and the sunfish. Interesting. And that, and that would look like the single eggs that we sometimes use exactly. for steelhead, too. So it must just be a shape and a color and a, and a bit of sugar uh, that says mealtime. The, the fish that sees that probably feels the way I do when the bobber twitches when I'm bluegill fishing. That's right. Direct to the pleasure center, I'm going to eat now. That's right. And how much corn is used in the scenting of scented baits also. So, I mean, it's sure. something that the bait industry has certainly picked up on. So Sure, sure. All right, you mentioned the oil. You're the bluegill guru. I need bluegill guru level response here. What's your favorite way to eat bluegill? It's very simple. I mix uh, complete pancake flour and cornmeal about 50-50. I roll, just roll the fish in it. I don't dip it in milk or anything. I try to do it about four hours before I'm I'm cooking them so that that can kind of soak in a little bit. And I toss them in my half inch of, of hot oil and turn them before I think it's time because they'll continue cooking after you've, you've made that motion. And uh, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. And I'm right there simple. with you. We, I hadn't heard the pancake mix before. Well, you know, cornmeal and peanut oil is our go-to here and yeah, fry them crispy and serve them with slaw. That's right. That's right. And maybe you can, then you have to decide, uh, uh, you know, whether you're going to use ketchup or some other uh, thing to, to dress them up. But, uh, oh, hot sauce. We're Southerners, hot, man. Put hot sauce on everything. <laughs> there you go. I'm a Northerner. You know, I'm, I live three blocks from the house. Uh, I used to say th that I grew up in, but I haven't grown up yet. So the house that I was raised in, and I'm just three blocks away and probably fifth generation to, to live in this town. So. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I use a similar line. Whenever anybody asks me, where'd you grow up? I always say I haven't decided where that's going to happen yet. That's right. And and again, I hope I hope we never lose that because a lot of people give it away. Uh, well, that's why you got to keep bluegill fishing because that's the injection right there. That's right. That's right. Hey, let's move on to some bigger fish. Um, you and I have both written about sturgeon and I've become more and more interested in sturgeon fishing around the country. There are eight different species of sturgeon in the U.S., and here in Florida, we have three of them in the Gulf of Mexico and the rivers of northwest Florida. But as a threatened species, it's illegal to fish for them here. But up where you are, Saginaw Bay has a long history of sturgeon fishing, 
to the extent that the fishery has now been overfished for a long time. And you recently wrote about fisheries management work in Saginaw Bay to protect and grow the sturgeon fishery there. Could you talk about those efforts? And then I'm going to ask you about sturgeon fishing there. The, the sturgeon was relatively prolific, as much as a, a large fish is going to be. They're never going to be huge numbers. They were very important to the, the local Native Americans. They were the first fish to run up the rivers in the spring. And after, you know, having no fresh food through the winter, this was a major thing to have an eight-foot fish show up that, that you could catch and eat. So it was important. When our commercial fishermen took over the, the, the bay, uh, the sturgeon was a problem for them. They were after smaller fish, and these big sturgeon with their armor plate would get into the nets and tear them apart. So the commercial fishermen would, would kill them, pile them up on shore, and, and burn them because they were so oily. And then they discovered that, that the, the eggs had a, a major cash value, so they actually pursued the sturgeon uh, to, to get the row and turn it into caviar. On top of that, pollution certainly didn't help them, and damming the rivers that they used to spawn on certainly didn't help them. So we've cleaned up a lot of the pollution. We've taken out some of the dams so that they have spawning water available, and we've protected them in other ways, and they're gradually coming back. Uh, sturgeon are being reared and, and planted now. It's really interesting when you're out with a biologist and you're releasing sturgeon, and the biologist says, well, they may be back in 20 years. Will, will we still be here? Because it takes them that long to become uh, sexually mature and, and come back into the rivers in which they were originally planted. I don't know that there's any, I don't think there's any legal sturgeon fishing on Saginaw Bay now. I think they're totally protected. We have a couple of places in the state where you can catch them on hook and line and keep them uh, down in the southeast part of the state. We have one lake up north which has a uh, spearing season each winter, and it draws hundreds of people, and they have to keep in very close touch with the DNR and report any fish that they spear immediately the limit is six and this year that season lasted 22 minutes before those six fish were taken and the, the whole thing was shut down uh, to the west minnesota and wisconsin they have a few more opportunities than that but the, they're a tremendous fish they're at the opposite end of of the bluegill uh, on the on the fish spectrum where you can't you know get excited about taking one home to eat because the odds are against you uh, they're also long lived. They're not as productive. Uh, so there's not the surplus that there is with the smaller fish. Yeah. I just saw, in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, an interesting story. It's black Lake, uh, where they were doing all the sturgeon fishing and they didn't mention the spearing, but in the news story I read, they had a sturgeon season that lasted a grand total of 65 minutes because the 630 registered anglers for this year's season all maxed out their six fish limit within the first 65 minutes of the season. So when the season opened at 8 a.m., by 9.05, that season was over. That's like more than 3,700 sturgeon caught in just over an hour on that lake, and the lake's about ah. 10,000 acres. That seems pretty incredible to me, that that many fish that fast. Well, as, as much as I love journalism, there is some faulty journalism there because that six-fish limit was for the entire – group of anglers that was the limit for the whole lake right so, so so those how many hundred fishermen there were only six of them succeeded oh. in taking a fish oh, that was some yeah. bad writing then because that, the way yeah. the story made it sound was that all 630 got six fish right yeah and and that's that's actually the lake that i'm talking about i thought it was 22 minutes but it, it, virtually no time at all but that that's why they have to stay in touch the, the biological limit is seven fish. They set it at six so that they don't accidentally go over. Uh, well, well, there we go. That's now, now we go back to the writing and how, how the story gets told, because according to the story I looked at, it was 65 minutes. I'm going to trust your 25 minutes over the story now. But yeah, it made it very, it, the sentence was pretty plain that 630 fishermen each got their six year, their six fish limit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, and that, and, the, the same way that we don't uh, catch every fish that we hook, we don't successfully draft every sentence to, to make it as clear as possible. So uh, I like both challenges of knowing that, that failure is possible if, if I don't pay attention. But I also believe that anytime you read a piece and get the wrong impression, it's the writer's fault. 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Man, I keep thinking about that still, though. Six fish, 630 anglers out there on the water. That must be some frustrating competition. You know, I think most of the people who are out there freely accept that. And that, and that's part of the fun that it's like buying a lottery ticket. They know that they're they're going to be shut down within an hour and it's probably not going to be them. But still, the prospect of seeing a six foot or eight foot fish through a hole in the ice and being able to to spear it. Uh, is the kind of once in a lifetime thrill that they're willing to take that gamble for. Have you speared one? I have not. I have sat in a shanty. Uh, I've seen gar down there. I've not seen a sturgeon yet. And I think that I've lost my desire to spear one. I think I want to see one. I'm not sure that, that I want to kill one, uh, which is an interesting transformation as we go through our different stages of, of fishiness. Uh, I'm not a, uh, a diehard catch and release angler for most other species, but one that could live to be a hundred years. Uh, I think about it a little bit. Find a little connection there as you uh, get up there in years. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that, that could well be it. I would love to try eating some sturgeon. I understand it's very good and I haven't had that opportunity. Uh, so if somebody else, uh, you know, I feel the same way about bear hunting. Uh, I like to try a little bit of bear meat, but I don't, I'm, I don't have the juices flowing to, to go out and, and try to take one myself. I don't know how to explain it. I have a group of friends that that's a, a, been an on, ongoing conversation for many years. Of we, we actually got bear recipe books. And uh, the question is, um, everything we've read says bear is absolutely terrible to eat. Yeah. But, uh, there's a cookbook out there. We got it. And so we have this challenge now to see who's going to bring in the bear that we actually get to test some of these recipes on. That's been an ongoing thing for a group of us. I will say also our, our mutual friend, Carrie Zilka um, has done the spearing thing. And I'm really eager to talk to her about her experiences uh, spearing, yeah. uh, spearing sturgeon. Yeah. But again, I love being in the, in the coop or the shanty uh, having a, a friend or two there and, and spending lots of time just talking about the world. It was really fascinating when we did it at Lake of the Woods, the concept that it was 28 below zero outdoors and it was 72 degrees in the shanty. There was a hundred degree difference by simply going out the door. Uh, that uh, encourages you to stay indoors and that encourages you to, to converse uh, even when the fish aren't biting. So that was delightful. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to ask you about some of those experiences in just a second. I did want to sure. say one more thing about sturgeon before we move on. You know, I also don't think people recognize, particularly because we're talking about freshwater fish way up rivers, way into the interior, but we're talking about fish that in your area can get upwards of seven feet long, weigh as much as 300 pounds. And I know that in Oregon, they have them up because I've been surgeon fishing there. They have them up to 12 feet and even heavier. I mean, these are not little fish by any stretch of the imagination. Absolutely. And they don't grow that big by eating big things. They're, they're basically the vacuum cleaners that, that move around the bottom and, and eat bits and pieces of whatever they can. They're not consuming four feet fish, four foot long fish to, to, to build up their bulk. So uh, it takes them a long time. They're, uh, they're, they're fascinating creatures. Yeah, absolutely. I went to a, uh, a sturgeon um, fishery breeding place where they're bringing, you know, uh, sturgeon fry and growing them and then putting them back in the rivers around Oregon and Washington. And that was just fascinating to see. Hey, let's shift gears again. Now, for Southerners in the U.S., the word fishing is almost synonymous with bass fishing. And a lot of that has to do with the work that Ray Scott did to develop BASS, the tournament bass circuit. And it also had a lot to do with what Forrest Wood did to develop the bass boat ethos and that market with ranger boats. But when you think about Michigan, bass aren't the main target species that immediately come to mind. You know, you we mentioned before all those other species, walleye, pike, muskie, salmon, trout, and now sturgeon. And these are sort of the celebrities of your region. But how should we be thinking about Michigan bass? Well, Kevin Van Dam just announced that he's going yeah. to retire. Uh, he's uh, His home is 100 miles from mine. So we, we have a, a vibrant bass fishing community, particularly in the southern half of the state. Uh, it's just that we have so many other good things, too. Uh, we have tremendous uh, walleye tournament circuits, uh, if, if that's what you like. Uh, we've, we've got a real uh, plethora 
of freshwater opportunities here, first class. And we've got we've got the fierce competitors in the in the uh, the the sparkly boats, and we've got people in fishing kayaks, which is what I particularly love to do, uh, and everything in between. So you can you can pick your your activity here and your species and the way to go about it. Uh, it's it's wonderful. I love the 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 Midwest, the Great Lakes. Are bass fishing strategies the same in the Midwest? Are the Michigan largemouth the, you know, still we're using the same strategies, same rigs we're doing everywhere else in the country? I think so. Uh, uh, as as far as I know, I'm I'm not conversant as much as I'd like to be with the other parts of the country. I think it might be scaled back a little bit. Our cover isn't quite as thick. Uh, a six pound largemouth is a huge bass up here. Uh, you know, so so. Again, it's, I think it's scaled back a little bit, but just as intense in terms of the, the spirit of the competitor. And we've got a nice mix of smallmouth bass, too, which a lot of people love. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I, I, I like the fact that you mentioned doing this uh, from the kayak. I do a lot of kayak fishing myself and do a fair amount of kayak tournaments. Um, but sometimes those tournaments here are offshore out in the Gulf Stream where we paddle out. and uh, A little bit different than the lakes of, uh, of Michigan. Well, yes, but but I paddle out on Lake Michigan and troll for Chinook salmon and have hooked them up to 20, 25 pounds and have them drag me all over the, the lake. Uh, I don't know how much different that experience would be. Uh, no, that sounds about right. And it sounds like fun. I mean, as you keep talking, I keep thinking, I got to come to Michigan. I mean, there are a lot of species there that I need to spend some time with. You know, I don't ha I've never caught a pike. You saw me catch my first walleye. I have never caught a muskie. I've caught tons of salmon in Alaska, lots of trout, a couple of sturgeon. But, you know, there's a lot of a lot of fishing in Michigan I need to come try out. Well, come on up anytime. I have this this uh, bad habit as regards small boats, uh, kayaks and canoes. And I think there's nine of them around here now. So we can find something to, to, to go do anytime. Have you caught a steelhead? Um, I have not caught a steelhead. There you go. You, you got to come up and we'll go do it. But there's... There's about three or four different ways I love to fish for steelhead. So, Oh, I definitely want to try that. I mean, that's one of those fish that has such a celebrity image in the literature of fishing, right? There's always that, and we went steelhead fishing. Um, or even, even the slight mentions. I, I don't know why it popped into my head, but in the Stand By Me movie, when they're trying to find the body along the railroad track, they've decided that their alibi is we were steelhead fishing. And so it's just, it's just kind of that prevalent fish in a lot of the ways we talk about Midwestern fishing. Well, here, here's a question for you. Given that the scientists now say the steelhead is a closer relative to the coho and Chinook salmon than it is to the other so-called trout, how much of that is, is marketing and brand and how much of it is, is the, the, the fish itself? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, that basically it's guys like you and me, and then some of the big names, like I was speaking, to, speaking with John Garrick recently, who have romanticized all these different fish into different positions, right? We've created a culture around it, uh, not just the, the capital culture of what gear to sell, but there's an ethos of the native brook trout versus the you know, the genetically modified rainbow, or even now the bluegill that we were just talking about, you know, that have been introduced as non-native species all over the place. So yeah, I mean, now you're going to tell me a steelhead is closer related to a king salmon. All right, now now my interest peaks a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. But, and and that's, I think that's a couple decades old now that, that they looked at it closely. So we've got a lot of so-called trout here. And we've got the, the brown trout whose closest relative is a an Atlantic salmon, oddly enough. We've got the brook trout and lake trout, which are char. We've got the the steelhead, which we now think is a like a Pacific or a Northwest salmon. So uh, not unlike some of the saltwater categories where you'll have how many different kinds of perch, how many different kinds of bass that, that aren't really relatives. Uh, we're kind of running into that ourselves. I wonder how popular the steelhead would be if instead of steelhead, it was called marshmallow tail. You know, it's, some some of it is is branding. Well, and some of those things have been intentionally addressed, right? You know, uh, the name sea bass was added as a marketing tool for an edible fish, and it used to have some ridiculous name that everybody thought was disgusting. Or, or here, the way the word sheep's head gets used uh, down here versus the way it gets used up in, say, Sheep's Head Bay, New York. 
And, you know, is that is that a word that will entice somebody to buy this fish to eat it or to go catch this fish? And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of marketing involved in how we name our fish. Or, we have a lot of sheep's head in Saginaw Bay, too, and we call them red drum sometimes. Right. Well, and see, a red drum here is what that's the number one fish people come to Florida fish for is an actual red drum. And right. you mentioned the word bass. I just wrote about the fact that most things that we call bass, even in the freshwater world, aren't actually bass. You know, and, right. and when you take a sea bass or a red bass, the you know, saltwater, those aren't bass. It's just right. a word we use because it's familiar. Or the thing I've written about, too, that I find interesting, I don't want to go off onto a tirade about this, but <laughs> when the name of the Jewfish got switched to the Goliath grouper, and I called the group, the ichthyology group that had issued this, and now every magazine, you know, for the last 15, 20 years or however long it's been, won't write the word Jewfish, they'll only write Goliath grouper. And when I called to ask why they did this, they had one complaint in 20 years that they saw the word Jewfish as being anti-Semitic. Right. When I asked them if they had traced the history of that term, none of them had. Right. And um, so, you know, I wrote about this in one of my books. It's actually a term of endearment. <laughs> and so, you know, I refuse to go the Goliath group around. I'm not going to let the, the 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 man decide for me what yeah. I'm calling my fish. Yeah. And and I think the, the fact that we talk about the origin of the phrase and so on with some sensitivity accomplishes everything that we need to accomplish, whether we actually make the change or not. You know, you don't have to change the name of Squaw Lake to suit me as long as we talk about where the phrase comes from and, and why some find it pejorative. So uh, I think just the opening up the discussions accomplishes most of it. I completely agree. And I get very frustrated and, and I don't want to take this into the political realm, but I get very frustrated when we shut down the conversation instead of having the conversation nope 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 can't say that uh so we're not going to talk about it so yeah we say this is why i wish you wouldn't and then let's go fishing right absolutely all right let's slide out on the ice then okay right. you know, i mentioned at the outset that you and i met on a media outing to lake of the woods in minnesota which from my perspective was basically a trip to the north pole I have never been in weather like that. Like you said, it was minus 28 degrees one morning. And I don't think we ever saw temperatures over zero the whole time we were there. So we spent two days in what you've referred to as the shanties, which are basically portable wooden sheds sitting on a bench, holding what we have to would have to have been the smallest fishing rods I've ever fished with, fishing through holes in the floor of the shed. And I do want to admit that when we first stepped into that little ice shack, it looked to me to look exactly like one of those temporary buildings the movies always show next to the barracks on a military base in the desert, somewhere where they take prisoners for questioning, just plywood walls, a few wooden benches, and a single, and I am not exaggerating here, a single beat-up old folding metal chair and some holes in the floor that instantly brought the word oubliette to my mind. But that image quickly dissolves, and those little rooms took on a very distinct, cozy feeling. And because we were with a great group of folks when we were doing that, it was a great place to be. And I should say, too, that I really don't want to paint a bleak picture of the place because the area is just jaw-droppingly gorgeous. The ice houses were fantastic, and I'm certainly glad we were in them rather than out on the ice at, and the resort where we stayed was fantabulous. I could hang out at Riverbend Resort for long periods of time. So here's the unique situation that unfolded while we were sitting there on the bench together, which kind of sounds like an Arlo Guthrie song now that I say it. And what I was thinking of would be the torture shed on the ice is that there I was with absolutely zero ice fishing experience, basically no knowledge, as much a Guggen as it gets. And there you are sitting next to me probably one of the most knowledgeable ice fishing guys in the history of ice fishing. Now, you've been writing about ice fishing for a long time now. I've seen several of your articles that you've written, not just about the trip we took, but stretching back over the last 40 years. And back in 1985, you wrote a book about ice fishing right at the moment when ice fishing was changing in the U.S. Could you talk first about why you're so enamored by ice fishing and then talk about that evolution of ice fishing from the time that you wrote Ice Fishing Methods and Magic, which you described to me as coming out on the cusp of modern ice fishing. 
that history really intrigues me as a pure neophyte. So talk to me about the evolution of ice fishing into modern ice fishing and what it is about ice fishing that has garnered so much of your attention over the years. Sure, I'd love to. First, I'm going to address your description of the ice house of the shanty, because my perception when that door opened was, this is the most luxurious <laughs> setting I have ever ice fished in. Someone else has done all the work, the heater's already on, the holes are drilled, and no matter how cold it is, we're going to be cozy in here. So so, so some of that reflects back to, to 1985 or 1975 when I started seriously ice fishing. I've always been captivated by the concept that I'm on top of a lake and on the other side of this chunk of ice are fish carrying out their life. And I'm going to, to somehow connect with them and extract them and bring them up to join me up in, in the, uh, the air-filled universe, as you will. Uh, the things I like about ice fishing is it's so accessible. Most of my fishing has been walking on, on the lakes rather than snowmobiles and vehicles and stuff like that. Most of my fishing up until recent years has been in the open, sitting on a five-gallon pail uh, out in the center of the lake, uh, experiencing the elements, finding a way to stay warm, keep the wind at my back, keep the hole from filling up with slush. Uh, I've always enjoyed that a great deal. In 1985, when, when my book came out, there were no commercially made rods and reels for ice fishing. There were a few custom rods. You tried to, to get your own spinning reel to, to work under those harsh conditions. Uh, electronics, fish finders had just started becoming popular for open water fishing, for on boats. Uh, now we have ice fishing units that have GPS built in, and they're specifically designed to work well straight down through the ice with batteries that hold up to the cold. That's, that's all brand new. Clothing, uh, in 85, it was mostly snowmobile suits. Uh, clothing borrowed from other sports that, that were adapted to, to ice fishing. Uh, shelters. There were no portable shelters. We have pop-up, uh, they look like blinds, but they're pop-up tents that, that we can move, fish a hole for half an hour, and if it's no good, we can easily move, drill another hole, and, and flip the top over uh, to, to protect us. Uh, even the, the shanties or shacks that originally looked like like outhouses with the hole on the floor instead of instead of on the seat. They're now large. They're well heated. Uh, they have light systems. They have battery systems. We looked at that at that sleeper, which we were wise enough not to try to sleep in. Uh, it had it had bunks. It had a big TV on the wall. So if you brought your generator, you could watch the ball game, or you could rent a generator from from those fine folks. So it's really become mainstream. And where in the past it was mostly middle-aged and older white guys out there fishing like like men on ice or one of the the humor uh, movies about ice fishing now it's whole families and 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 both genders and kids and 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 everything else because technologically it's relatively easy to get the equipment you need and go out there and have a good time where before you you had to put in a fair amount of suffering to to learn the hard way so Fortunately, it looks like I may have the opportunity to update my book, which was a different approach to ice fishing. And I'm, I'm going to send you a copy of the original 85 edition. It's about half essays, word pictures, telling stories about being out on the ice and, and ways that, that we learn to ice fish and, and what it's like to watch the sun come up when you're two miles out on Grand Traverse Bay, Lake Michigan, what it's like to watch the sun go down on Houghton Lake and the, and the walleye start to bite. So a lot of those essays uh, still hold up. It looks like I might be able to revise the book and That's great. keep a number of those, which are the magic part, and update the, the methods part of the book to reflect uh, the, the new equipment and new approaches to ice fishing. I'm just thrilled. Uh, and that was my reason for going to Lake of the Woods, was to get some new experiences, meet some new people, try some new equipment. Uh, and that was really rewarding for me. That's fantastic. You've said a couple of things there I want to follow up on. So this may seem incongruent, but let's start with um, the gear, you know, especially the use of what you guys call flashers, which was sort of the old term for depth finders and fish finders, you know, and when Lawrence first started those, I have to admit that was so new to me. I'm not sure I can still wrap my head around staring at a portable screen 
trying to figure out which little light on the screen is your bait and to watch for the fish coming through on a screen rather than watching the water. And these flashers are so well tuned that you could actually pick out the difference between your little quarter inch lure and a minnow swimming by. Talk to me about that. I mean, that that to me is that's almost a video game rather than fishing in some ways. It it gets to be that point, and it gets even more that way when you introduce underwater cameras, which have, have caught on a lot too. What's interesting about the sounders that we call flashers is that in our in our cabin was uh, our our fishing shack was a Vexlar unit, and that's actually like the old sounder with the revolving wheel and the light that lights up. <clears throat> the other ones that we were using, the hummingbirds are more like conventional sounders, but they simulate that flasher face. They have the round face on there. Just for those of us who learn to fish using those, you can actually set those up to, to, to transmit the information much like a, a, a boat's graph does now. Uh, but since we have them on flasher mold, uh, mode, that's what we call them. I know people who, if they forget their electronics, will go home rather than fish. I'm not at that point. I still watch the line carefully. I pay attention to the rod tip, but I'm really watching the tension in the line most of the time. I use the, the flasher to keep me interested, to let me know if a fish moves into the area. Uh, the people who claim that they can tell everything by the flasher, I, I don't always fully believe that. I've caught fish that never showed up on the flasher for some strange reason. Uh, however, when you've got them dialed in right, and you've got a little teeny teardrop lure with a waxworm on it, and a waxworm is maybe a quarter of an inch long, not much longer, there are times when I can tell when a fish has stolen my bait because the image of, of that lure looks different without the mass of, of the, the the grub on it. So it's, it's, a, it's a great aid. It really helps you keep track of the depth of the water. You can tell pretty conclusively what the bottom is like, whether it's hard pan or whether it's soft and mucky and might have some bugs growing in it or some weeds above it. Uh, it's, it's not quite absolutely required for fishing, uh, but there are a lot of people who, who dearly love that component of, of their fishing approach. You know, there were very few moments over those two days we were in that box fishing that it was quiet. There were a lot of storytelling, a lot of chattering, getting to know each other. But in those moments of quiet, and you always want those when you're fishing, you know, you got to have some moments where you're in your own he head. I looked around and I realized everybody's staring at their screens. And instead, it looked to me like when I walk into my classes and all my students are staring at their phones rather than at each other and stuff. But it was a very, very kind of weird moment in looking around and everybody's staring at the screen. And I had no idea how to read the screen. So I'm looking down the hole the whole time thinking I got to see something going on down there. But it is it is kind of a, a, a weird visual to have, you know, four or five guys in a room, each looking at their own screen, deadly silent uh, while they're fishing. It was it was just kind of a weird moment for me. Yeah. And I'm not sure I like it. Uh, <clears throat> I think it would be it would be a better world if we were in that ice, ice house with no cell phones. And no fishing electronics. Now, I don't know who, who among us could actually stand that, but I think we'd all be better people if, if we did that now and then. When I taught as an adjunct, there were not cell phones, so I never had to deal with that. I typically had one stoner in the back of the room with a headset on list, listening to music I didn't understand, but but not everybody looking at a, at a cell phone. So it is a different world. Uh, when I fish with, with my close friends, we will typically fish close enough together that we use one sounder between us and we can see both of our lures on it. At least, at least that joins us in the experience so that, so that we're not parallel We're we're actually more in series, if you will. Um, and we, we, you know, we talk about who's sick and who's healthy and, you know, all those things that, that are part of a fishing trip to catch up on the small talk. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not happy when everybody has their own, and is only focused on that. I like the, the conversational parts of fishing too much for that. You, you and I shared one for a while and you were, you, you kept asking me, Oh, you see that that's a fish or you see that that's your lure. And 
I did the, the the standard neophyte thing who didn't want to admit, I have no clue what you're talking about. I don't, yeah. I don't Oh, yeah, absolutely. I see that. Yeah. I had yeah. no idea what I was looking at. There may have been times when I was faking it, too. I think <laughs> I think confidence has has a great deal to, to do with that. When you think there's a fish there, you fish better. Right. When all you see is an empty screen, it's really hard to 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 maintain the enthusiasm. So so I, I wouldn't worry about that. We're probably much closer in uh, perceptive skills than you think. <laughs> so let's go back to some of the other stuff you said. While we were there, I recognize that ice fishing is pretty big business. It's not just a few ho- hardcore guys like you mentioned with an auger. It's not an extreme support. It's very popular. Everyone's involved. It allows places like Lake of the Woods to extend their fishing season to a year-round fishery. And I mean, even the sleeper hut that you mentioned that you and I visited, and some of those, what they call them, big ice castle portables, these are like RVs on the ice. I had no idea that this was the case. Could you talk about the popularity of ice fishing in the northern parts of the country now and you know what it means to be able to buy what, to me, looked like you know, uh, a high-end RV that you would use tailgating at a at a Michigan game, uh, you know, rather than an ice hut, and how that industry has expanded since you started. You mentioned, you know, the development of rods and reels and things, but what about the overall industry? Yeah, the 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 rods and reels have certainly developed. The portable shelters have. I had not seen the degree of of units that we saw out there. I had heard of the sleepers. I had, I had heard of the, the wheelhouses, they call them, where they're on a trailer, they drag it out onto the lake, and then they have hydraulics so that they can lower the trailer. The wheels go in inside it, and now it's flat on the ice. Uh, and I thought, well, that is just crazy to have units that expensive and, and that uh, elaborate until I realized that they have a six-month ice fishing season up there, an eight-month ice fishing season. You could use one of those a lot more than than you would use a summer cabin that you had to maintain. And and you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars is a lot of money. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't get you very far in a boat. And up there, you only have a three or four month boating season, so it does make some sense. Uh, I'm not sure I'm drawn to it because I like to move around from lake to lake. More than that, they're particularly good for when people are going to a certain lake. What they do to the economies is is just tremendous. When talking with Brandy there at at, uh, at River Bend, she said they really didn't have an ice fishery up there a few decades ago. That that's come on more recently. Uh, I think the the reasons for that is the generally expanded uh, availability of information. You can learn all you need to know about ice fishing by by going to YouTube videos and. And, and blogs and, and podcasts and stuff like that, where you used to have to find a geezer that would take you out on the ice and, and show you what to do and yell at you when you did it wrong. So it's, it's a lot more comfortable to do it now. On your way, you're going to stop into a modern sporting goods store that has a million-dollar inventory of all the clothes, the power augers, the shelters, everything you need in, in one spot. So your, your biggest requirement is that you have a healthy credit card that you can use to, to, to buy these things. So it does have a tremendous economic impact. Uh, you know, you, you know, the fuel that's purchased, the bait that's bought, uh, but even beyond that, some of these larger purchases and, and real lifestyle choices that require investment, uh, That those investments are important. And we're seeing that this year. We have an unusually mild winter in Michigan. Lake I was on this week had six inches of ice. It normally has two feet of ice. And the season started a month late, and it's going to end a month early in all likelihood. And people who sell equipment and sell bait and sell gas, they're, they're feeling that effect. So it's been pretty interesting. It reminds us of how much we we rely on things that, that we tend to take for granted, like a harsh winter. Oh, absolutely. And we see that in all environments, you know, down here, how much of a hurricane season are you going to get has a massive impact on the economy or red tide or other other environmental factors that we don't really have, you know, direct control over. Um, Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I think you're exactly right that it is guys like you and me and all the other media folks that have popped up over the years. I mean, when you started being an outdoor writer, there was, you know, maybe one per newspaper in the country and, you know, a handful of folks who wrote books, but now 
everybody who's got a camera is now, you know, broadcasting information about outdoors. And, you know, the whole reason you and I were there was because they wanted us broadcasting information about ice fishing up there, you know, spreading the (laughs) word. And I think that's really interesting in terms of how now those economies are affected. I will say, too, that the stories of trucks going through the ice and the stories of, particularly since we've gotten back, I don't know if you heard about the uh, ice anglers that died in the Northeast recently, those things had me nervous. And so it does add an edge of, uh, of kind of excitement to the possibility. And I guess I was nervous in the same way that outsiders, visitors, tourists worry about the things we just don't know about. Like when folks come down here, hurricanes or people going to California and earthquakes or tornadoes in Kansas. I guess it's just another form of on the water safety that you learn about. It's the guy from Minnesota whose rental car gets washed away when he drives on the beach in Hatteras, North Carolina, unaware of tides or soft sand and the inshore angler in the west coast of Florida whose boat gets stuck on a sandbar for about six hours because he didn't know about the tides, local knowledge stuff. Um, and I guess ice fishing is just like every other fishing that you have to learn the water and safety and respect the, the environment. Um, you know, even when the water is rock hard on the surface, I, I have to tell you, I, th- those stories scared the hell out of me. And I was nervous when we were driving, even though I realized there wouldn't be that many ice shanties out here if, you know, people were falling through every couple of minutes. Um, you know, rationally, I got it, but there was still that element of fear. And I will say also, it's going to make me go back when it's open water, because I, I cannot picture the place now as water. To me, it's just a field. A solid right. rock hard field. I want to go back and see the water. But those kinds of stories, they also add to that ethos. So they do. They do. And to a certain extent, we kind of like that that hint of danger. Uh, I have to say <clears throat> that every time I go on the ice, I say, okay, this is the day that things are going to turn to crap. How am I gonna how am I gonna react to that? in my coat on the right hand side chest pocket? are a pair of spikes that I can pull out. If I go through the ice on foot, I can use those to pull myself onto the ice, do a self-rescue. When we went out in the trucks, I looked them over to see how would I escape if this started going through. Now, I, the only time I ever went through the ice was on a hunting trip. Uh, but I always think that my next ice fishing outing how, uh, may pose that problem. The first day we went out, I knew that the shandies would be warm. We were told we could fish in our pajamas. I still wore winter boots, a full ice fishing suit. I had wool long underwear on. I was prepared if the heater didn't work at all or the truck broke down. Uh, Ultimately, I was prepared to take care of myself if the others had been unable uh, for one reason or another not to take care of me. I think that's part of ice fishing. I think uh, a a corollary is when you go out on the, the blue water, do you take your own life jacket along even if it's somebody else's boat? Because you have certain certain Pack your levels own parachute, of, man. Pack your that's own right. parachute. That's right. You take your own ditch bag uh, because ultimately it may be up to you to save your own butt. I fear that we've lost some of that where we have the, the available information. When you, you watch the How to Ice Fish videos, they're not going to talk about that because they want to be upbeat. Where the old geezer said, yeah, my, my buddy Bob, he just about bought it over here you know, 50 years ago. So, so I fear that we've lost a little bit of that individual responsibility. Yeah, I was very grateful that people talked to me about that. Um, I was also grateful, and I'll give a shout out to the folks at Clam for providing me with an ice suit that had a flotation capability, um, because I certainly didn't own an ice suit. Um, I barely owned <clears throat> pants, let alone something like an ice suit. Sure. Um, and so I was very grateful for the people talking to me about how do you do, you know, and some of the logic was the same. Um, I think a lot of us, particularly my brothers are both, in addition to faculty, they're both law enforcement. And they taught me to carry a, uh, a pocket knife that has a component for breaking uh, windows should your car go off a bridge sure. or something like that. And so I, you know, yeah. Those kind of things were were important, but it was a, it was good to learn that stuff. And I think you're right; we don't think about that here in Florida. Amongst the guys I fish with, we have a, a rule that we try to spread. When you're offshore, when you're inshore, and you see a squall, always uh, you always assume that thing is headed for me. Yeah. And so you you never say, "Oh, it's going the other way," or we can wait it at no nope, squall's coming for you. Be prepared for the trouble. Uh-huh. And so you know, ditch bags, um, just in case bags. 
you know, we carry them in our cars. We can't, you know, and 99% of the folks we fish with have never heard of doing such things. So I think you're I right. A, I have a little uh, uh, a pouch of emergency gear that I call the Jimbo bag. And my brother's name was Jimbo and, and he lost his life after he got lost out in the Olympic peninsula in Washington oh, wow. and, uh, and perished to hypothermia where if he had had a fire starting kit, a one, a dollar store poncho, you know, a space blanket, a whistle, the things that are in this bag, it might've made all the difference. Uh, and, and I think everybody should, should think, you know, number one, how do I avoid trouble? And if it finds me, how do I deal with it? Uh, and that used to be a big part of learning to hunt and learning to fish, uh, you know, build an emergency shelter, all those kinds of things that, that I fear, uh, we've lost a little bit of and i don't i don't praise up the good old days or anything like that i just think it's an opportunity where we can enrich our experiences now by by cultivating and and pursuing some of those skills yeah i completely agree we call them jic bags just in case bags yeah um, yep. I've, I've written about them I, I i think they're a big important part of things and not just for when you're doing an activity you know like uh you know going fishing or going hunting but on a daily basis too. I mean, you know, I, there was a day, the second day we were in the ice hut and I said, uh, I'm, I'm leaving the ice suit because I can walk from the, the, the 10 feet from the truck to the door without being too cold. And then I'm in that, you know, like you said, 78 degree room all day. I don't want to be in the ice suit. And one of the guys with us said, carry the ice suit with you. What yeah. happens if the truck breaks down and you've got to stand outside for an hour waiting for a tow? not even on the ice, but just on the right. roads around. And so that, that level of thinking about on a daily basis, what, it, what is my JIC bag? What do I need to have with me? You know, yeah. I, I put uh, things like battery chargers or so I carry solar battery chargers wherever mm -hmm. I go. And, you know, when I'm particularly when I'm back country in Alaska by myself, yeah, then the JIC bag becomes crucial. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think you're right. That's a, that's a lesson that we, we don't impart as much anymore. And to me, that enriches the fun part of the fishing, too, knowing that, hey, we're having a great time. We're catching fish. You know, the guy's delivering pizza in the truck from, from the resort. But if things turn sour, if we were stuck out there for a day or two, if the truck broke down, we'd be prepared to, to, to take care of it and, and make a good story out of it. I mean, we, we love good stories. Right. Uh, and that preparation is part of it, not just reporting what someone else tells us, but what transformations have we gone through? How have we changed who we are? Do, are we more careful? Are we more appreciative? Are we more uh, awestruck with the fact that, that we're on this thing that looks like a parking lot that's full of walleyes underneath it? I mean, we, we just have to keep our eyes open and, and look at all the what ifs. Yeah, I agree completely. So Griff, this has been fantastic. But before we end this, I do want to ask you my traditional wrap-up question that I ask of all the guests on the Rodcast. And that is, what is your social security number, PIN number, and mother's maiden? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, no, no. As much as my listeners, or my listener to be accurate, hi, mom, um, as much as they would love that information, um, I think I need to ask you actually the real wrap-up question, which is, what is your grail fish? What's the bucket list fish for you that's still out there waiting to be grift? Wow. It might be the nine inch bluegill that my grandson Abe is going to catch with me someday because he reminds me of that joy. He still likes to take him home and put him in the fry pan. And at nine inches, I'm going to talk to him about the fact that for good convert conservation, let's toss back that nine incher to help eat the surplus fish. And let's catch an eight incher and take it home and eat it. And I, I really look forward to the day when our concept of conversation, our conservation, excuse me, and our childish glee intersect into an experience that, that takes care of the resource at the same time that we extract a bit of the surplus and and consume it together gleefully so i've caught a lot of the big freshwater fish and they're wonderful but i'm really about the the human connections now uh i hope that doesn't mean that i'm i'm getting into geezerhood but if so i embrace it 
I think that's a fantastic yeah. answer. And you know, the more people I talk to with that about that question, the more I'm intrigued and you know very much embrace the idea that it's not necessarily the fish that you're after, but it's who you're with. And also sometimes where you are, you know, just yeah. the experience of being somewhere you've never been before trying something new. Um, and particularly, you know, with a family member like a grandson, that's just a fantastic kind of way of thinking about what grail fish should be. Yeah. Um, I will just because it popped into my, uh, my, my, my strange thinking brain. And it's an adaptation of a joke that I probably shouldn't tell, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Do you know how in Florida we get a nine inch uh, bluegill? We fold it in half. Oh, oh, I'm on my way then. <laughs> I will give up ice fishing for a few days to, 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 to try that. I'll be right down. Steve, this has been fantastic. And I know that after we spent those two days in a sweat lodge, hallucinating images of that pizza and those beers, um, and God, those ribs at Riverbend. I don't know why I just thought of that. Of that. Those were great ribs. Sure. But I knew you and I would have to banter more and have sessions like this. So I really want to thank you for being on the broadcast and taking the time to talk with us today. Well, thank you. And come on up here to Michigan and we'll catch a bunch of fish and do a lot of talking. If it's on the record, fine. And if it's not on the record, even better. And, and uh, there's lots of fun to be had. Let's get together more and have some. I intend to take you up on that. Thanks. Okay. okay. Take, take care, Sid. All right, my listening crew, after that great conversation with Griff, I think it's time to take a bourbon break, or at least a whiskey pause, because this week on the Rodcast, I want to shoot the shit a bit about Jack Daniels' Tennessee Rye. And yes, if you recall, back in episode 1.24, that episode featuring the Bill Dance conversation, I did a bit of evangelizing about Jack Daniels' old number seven Tennessee whiskey. So I thought it was about time to turn a little deliberation toward another whiskey in the Jack Daniels line. And so on this week's bourbon break, Jack Daniels' Tennessee rye has caught the professor's eye. And so before I give you my thoughts about Jack Daniels Tennessee Rye, let me offer a bit of the official hype around the JDTR from the Jack Daniels company themselves. So from the Jack Daniels website, I quote, Introducing Rye Whiskey Made Jack's Way, crafted with our 70% rye grain bill, natural spring water from our own Cave Spring Hollow, and Jack's time-honored charcoal mellowing process. Jack Daniels Tennessee Rye is a whiskey that could only come from Lynchburg, Tennessee. Master distiller Chris Fletcher and the whiskey makers of the Jack Daniels Distillery have created a unique rye that's undeniably spicy and complex, yet sipping smooth. It might be one of our first new recipes in over 150 years, but if you know Jack, you'll know Jack Daniels Tennessee Rye. Man, that's a great description. I want to do that. I want to, I want to like do that in the in the deep voice, in the rye whiskey voice, and uh, and have Jack Daniels use me as their marketing guy. Hey, Jack Daniels, Jack Daniels rye is the whiskey come from Lynchburg, Tennessee. Yeah, I'm the guy for that right there. It's a great description. Yeah, so Jack Daniels introduced their rye in 2017, so it's a relatively new offering from one of this over 150 year old distiller. The J.D. Rye's mash bill is, as the thing said, a 70% rye blend, and the remaining 30% are filled in with 18% corn and 12% malted barley. You know, that's an interesting mash bill because it takes a similar kind of approach as Jack's Black 80% corn and 8% rye and 12% malted barley and just shifts the corn heavy to rye heavy and a slight adjustment to the minority grains to balance things out. Also, just like the Jack Black, the Jack Rye goes through the same maple filtration process in which the whiskey is drip filtered through a 10-foot bed of charcoal, which is made by igniting pyres of sugar maple with new distillate. So really, the Jack Rye is made with the same very successful process as the Jack Tennessee whiskey. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's a 90-proof whiskey, which is a tad higher than Jack Black, which is an 80-proof whiskey. And you know, as I say that, I realize that so far I keep talking about Jack Daniels rye in comparison with Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey, which may be an unfair thing to do since comparing a rye with a bourbon style whiskey really is comparing oranges and apples. But I suppose if you're going to put the name Jack Daniels on a product, 
you're going to be comp compared to your premier product, especially when your Paragon product has the reputation that Jack Black does. So without comparing Jack Daniels Black and Jack Daniels Rye, let's talk about the rye as a thing unto itself. All right, so the eye of the J.D. Rye sits somewhere between a golden hue and a brownish color, kind of suggesting the coloration of tea with hints of copper and tints of gold in there. I like that Jack Daniels kept the familiar and distinct Jack Daniels bottle style and label design, only with a light-colored label that is punctuated with some green coloration and a green seal around the bottle's neck. The classic Jack Daniels font familiarity decorates the label. The J.D. Rye's nose is fruitier than I expected, since with that high rye mash bill, I was expecting a spicier nose. And yes, there's some cinnamon and spice there, but the nose is very cherry with some undertones of grain. All right, now this might sound weird, but the palate of the Jack Daniels rye has an interesting kind of banana flavor to it. And the anticipated spice does show up in the palate that wasn't very bold in the nose. There's cinnamon and there's nutmeg here, which pair nicely with that banana. There's also a good taste of the smoky wood from the aging barrels. All in all, it's a very pleasant taste. But there's nothing there that either makes it unique to where you could say that the Jack Daniels rye has commanded its own identity as different from other ryes. But there is certainly nothing there that is off-putting or disappointing. I like the Jack Daniels rye taste, but probably because it's simple and commonplace. The finish of the Jack Daniels rye is rather short and not very inspiring. It doesn't linger. And again, when I thought the spice might come to the fore at the end of things, it didn't. And it let the finish somewhat left the finish somewhat dry with the banana again coming forward. So yeah, all in all, the Jack Daniel rye is pretty good. It's not a top tier rye. I would certainly drink it by choice. And, you know, even if I have other options, I might go to the Jack Daniels rye. And yeah, those are my thoughts about Jack Daniels Tennessee rye. As always, please keep in mind that the Fishing Professor Bourbon Break Reviews are not sponsored. The distillers have not sent me samples nor do they influence my reviews at all. But as I always say, I am open to sponsorship, bribery, and extortion. The bourbons I review are purchased out of pocket, and my reviews are based on the keen sense of whiskey know-how developed over many years in many of this country's finest watering holes, drinking establishments, dives, pubs, honky-tonks, and back-alley speakeasies. Hey, speaking of, let me give a shout-out to the Local 3 Kitchen and Bar in Atlanta, Georgia. This is just a great place to eat and drink, and they have a great selection of bourbons and whiskeys, and the place is gorgeous inside and they do everything they can to create a comfortable atmosphere without creating pretense their brown water menu is fantastic and well worth just sitting and reading and learning from let alone ordering from i really recommend if you're in the hot Atlanta area to stop by one of their tasting events or to swing in and try one of their flights especially the this little piggy flight oh so good just a great place so shout out to local three kitchen and bar in atlanta so here's to whiskey, scotch, or rye, amber, smooth and clear. It's not as sweet as a woman's lip, but a damn sight more sincere. Hey, as always, if you got comments about this week's bourbon break, feel free to email me at sid at inventifishing.com. And now back to the water. Okay, crew, it's time for this week's Fishing Professor Top 10 list. And this week, I want to look at 10 of my favorite spinning rods, specifically for inshore application. Now, look, I recognize that even within a category like inshore spinning rods, that's still a pretty big category, and that there are subsets within that group that I could whittle down into, like rods that are designed for West Coast application versus East Coast application, or lighter gear versus heavy-duty gear, one-piece versus two-piece, and so on. But I'm not going to drill down too far into those distinctions, with the exception of saying that all of the rods in this list are one-piece construction, and that I'm going to stick to spinning rods rather than casting rods for the sake of consistency in this list, even though many of the rod series I include in this list have casting versions as well as spinning versions. Likewise, even though there's probably a lot of value in it, 
I'm not going to address what reels I pair these rods with. I tend to try to pair a company's rods with the reels from the same company when that company makes both rods and reels. But in some case, that doesn't work out either because the company doesn't make reels to go with those rods or the reels aren't of the same quality and caliber as those rods or admittedly vice versa sometimes too. I should also note that a lot of the manufacturers whose rods are in my list make multiple series of rods, sometimes for different fishing approaches and sometimes to cover a gamut of price ranges. So they have a lower cost economy rod series and a higher end professional grade rod series with many gradations in between. And to be honest, there are a ton of rods out there that I just haven't fished with. So this list is made up with rods with which I'm familiar. Likewise, I've owned and still own several low-end inshore spinning rods by companies like Penn and Shimano that I keep on hand for when I take kids or kids' friends or adults who don't really know how to fish. I keep them on hand just as a precaution against having my better gear damaged by novice anglers. Now, while I rely on these rides as a, rods as a protective measure, I'm not going to bring them up in this list because while I carry one or two with me on the boat, I don't really use them myself. They're sort of backup safety systems when I'm fishing alone and a here, try this one when I'm with someone who is unanointed in the world of fishing. I also want to say that all of the rods in this list are really solid rods and that I wouldn't mind having a half a dozen of each and would gladly fish them regularly. That is to say, the countdown aspect and ranking of these, these rods on this list is really just a feature of convenience for talking about these rods. I'd be just as happy with rod number seven as rod number three. So to all of my rod manufacturing friends out there, don't get all bent out of shape when your rod is identified as rod number five and your competitor is rod number four. Everybody's a winner on this week's countdown. Trophies and certificates of participation for everybody. Okay, that's way too many disclaimers and pre-apologies. So let's count down some great rods. Okay, at number 10, let's go with Fenwick's HMG Inshore Spinning Rod. Now, I do have to say that I have only ever owned two Fenwick rods in my life, the HMG Inshore Spinning Rod and a five-weight fly rod I bought about 27 years ago when I was living in Kansas and wanted a fly rod for lakes and rivers and such. But alas, after the first attempt with the Fen Fenwick fly rod, I broke about six inches off the tip when I slammed it in the tailgate of my pickup, and I never repaired it. Sadly, too, I managed to break the tip of the HMG inshore rod as well, though I did replace the guide tip and was able to use it more often than the fly rod. Now, it's a seven foot medium weight rod that I like using with lighter line, like an eight or 10 pound line. I like its snap in the cast and the long cork butt. They make the HMG inshore rods in seven and seven and a half and eight foot versions, all available in medium light, medium heavy, and medium action. They're made with graphite blanks and Fuji alkanite guides. The Fenwick HMG inshore spinning rods are a redesign of Fenwick's freshwater HMG series. So there's a lot of history with that series. Just a great, reliable rod. All right, at number nine, let's go with Penn's Squadron 3 inshore spinning rod. And okay, yes, this is one of those rods that I initially bought because I needed to pick up a cheap rod in one of those instances where I needed a rod, but I didn't have the time, energy, or money to shop around and get a higher quality rod. But I saw the Squadron 3 and its $50 price tag. And since it's a pen rod, which is an automatic, you can trust this rod indicator, I grabbed one off the rack. And, and in hindsight, I should have grabbed a half dozen of them and used them as my kid rods. But I just got the one and I was really pleased with its performance. Pen makes five seven foot versions and two seven and a half foot versions. I got the seven foot light action, not just because of the context in which I'd be using it, but frankly, because that was what the store had. I ended up really liking the flexibility in the tip of this rod, and it had the strength I needed for the fish we were catching. It's a lightweight graphite blank with stainless steel guides and a solid cork grip. It's one of those rods that I keep around because it's fun to fish with. All right, at number eight, I'm going to go with St. Croix's Mojo Inshore Spinning Rod. However, I want to be honest and say that I don't own any of the St. Croix Mojo Inshore Spinning Rods. Rather, a buddy of mine has a few, and I use them when I'm fishing on his boat. He swears by them, and I found them very dependable and easy to work with. The Mojo Inshore spinning rods are available in multiple lengths, including a 6.6, a 7, a 7.6, a 7.9, and a 7.11. 
I like using the longer version for working popping corks and a shorter version for lures. Like the Fenwick rods, the Mojo rods were originally a popular freshwater series, but St. Croix added a saltwater series to the line. The blank is an elite SC three carbon blank construction with integrated polycurve. And I'll admit, I have no idea what integrated polycurve means. They use Sea Guide Hero high grade guides with slim alum aluminum oxide rings and a stainless steel gun smoke frames to finish the blank. I also like the color of these rods, which is kind of a dark aquamarine. They use a firm cork butt too, just a great rod to work with. All right, at number seven, how about the Compre inshore rod from Shimano? Now, Shimano makes several versions of rods under the Compre name. Perhaps best known are the Compre walleye rods. However, the Shimano Compre inshore rod series are just fantastic. This is a rod I carry on the boat and kayak just about every time I go out. It's made with a graphite blank, Concept Fuji aluminum oxide guides, the Shimano built reel seat, and great cork grips. It's available in 7.2, 7.4, 7.6, and 8 foot models, ranging from medium light to heavy versions. I've got a 7.2 medium fast version, and I really rely on it a lot. It casts well, and I feel comfortable really leaning into it with bigger fish. And as a rod that lists for just under 100 bucks, it's not only a great entry-level rod, it's got staying power, and it's going to last you a long time. All right, at number six, let's go with Ugly Stick's Carbon Inshore Spinning Rods. And to be clear, there is also an Ugly Stick Inshore Select series of rods, too. The Ugly Stick's rods carry on that fantastic strength that Ugly Stick is known for. I think the Ugly Stick Carbon Inshore Spinning Rod doesn't get as much attention as it should, but I guess that it might be tough given all of the quality bound up in so many of the ugly stick rod series but nonetheless the ugly stick carbon inshore spinning rod it's a fantastic rod they're available in six six models and seven foot models ugly stick boasts the carbon inshore spinning rod has been 50 50 percent stronger or is 50 percent stronger than other rods and 30 percent lighter they're made from a carbon blank and have a solid graphite tip which makes the rod very sensitive and the Ugly Tough Guides are just great. Just a great inshore rod series that brings that well-known Ugly Stick toughness to the inshore environment. Okay, I feel, a, I feel a Robert Frost poem coming on. We dance round a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. And yes, that brings us to the middle, to number five position in this week's list. And for that honored position, let's take Frost's word to heart and say that the number five inshore fishing rod is indeed a secret we should all know because it's coming in at number five and I've got to go with Cast King's Estuary Inshore Rods. Now, I got the opportunity to fish with the rods earlier in their release because my buddy Captain Jimbo Keith of Saltwater Assassins is a Cast King Pro staffer and he has his boat outfitted with Cast King's Estuary Inshore Rods. And back before the pandemic, I got the chance to put these rods to the test and review them for Inventive Fishing Video Gear Review. And you can see that video over on our YouTube channel. And if you take a look at Casking's Estuary Inshore Rods, you'll see why it's such a great rod. Nonetheless, let me say that these are great rods. I love how light they are and how strong. And yes, I love their pretty blue blank coloration too. These are graphite blanks that Casking finishes with their proprietary nano resin technology. And one of the standout features of the Cast King Estuary Inshore Rods is their use of American Tackle Company's revolutionary microwave air guides, which I'm sure you've heard me talk about before. And back in, oh gosh, what episode was it? Back in episode, uh, we got to go way back, episode 132, Kevin Landers of American Tackle Company and I talked a lot about those microwave guides. Um, I also like that Casking Estuary Inshore Rods use the ATC, the American Tackle Company, real seat, which are also really great real seats, but also which bring a different kind of aesthetic to the rod than most real seats do. They come in seven foot, seven, six, and eight foot models. These are without a question one of those rod series that I really wish I had a half a dozen or so to outfit my boat with. All right, at number four, let's turn to a great company that makes top-tier tackle, and that's Okuma and their DTR custom inshore rods. Now, there are both DTR custom inshore rods and offshore rods. 
But for this list, I'm just talking about the custom inshore rods. Now, these rods were designed for big reds in southern water, particularly in Louisiana. And depending on the model, they're specifically designed and identified as for working with popping corks, throwing sp spoons, or working jerk baits. They're built using a really light, low resin blank, and they have reinforced the uh, flex rod tip. They use Sea Guide XO and XQ series angled 316 uh, stainless steel guide frames with zirconium inserts. And these inserts are really interesting because they're designed specifically to work ideally with either braid or monofilament lines. They're built with a custom Fuji skeleton reel seat that has a woven carbon insert. So the reel seat, reel seat is especially sturdy. They come in seven foot models and seven foot two inch models. Just an all around great inshore rod from a great company with Okuma. All right, numero three. Let's go back to Penn and their Penn Battalion 2 inshore rod series. Of course, Penn is iconic in the fishing world and the Penn Battalion 2 rods and reels are some of their most popular series. Sure, the Penn Carnage 3 inshore spinning rods are fantastic and worth getting your hands on, and they're probably a step above the Battalion 2s, but the Penn Battalion 2 inshore rod series is fantastic. It's great. They're super light and super strong. They're made from Penn's SLC2 construction, which looks to me like Salt Lake City 2, which is kind of weird, but SLC2 construction with the inner spiral carbon wraps and outer layers of longitudinal carbon fires, fibers which make the rod incredibly strong. And in fact, I think that that's probably the standout for um, the, uh, the Battalion 2 is just the overall rod strength. Uh, they do use Fuji guides and reel seats, and they've got great cork butts. This is another great rod series that I wish I had several of. But then again, I'd also love an arsenal of the Carnage 3s as well. All right, in the runner-up position, I have to go with Daiwa's Saltus series. And yes, Daiwa makes Saltus reels too, so there's an easy pairing here. But the Saltus inshore rods are some of my favorites. And given that they provide top-tier reliability at a mid-range price point, these are rods worth the investment and certainly a series I'd like to have more of. Wow, it seems like what I'm saying here is, hey, there are a whole lot of good rods out there. I want more of them. Now, the Saltus, the Daiwa Saltus, um, they're made using Daiwa's high modulus carbon graphite with Daiwa's exclusive high volume fiber, low resin design, which builds a really light but strong rod. They're available in six, excuse me, they're available in six, six, seven, and seven, six models. This is a rod series that if I were guiding, I would seriously consider outf outfitting my boat with these because of their strength and reliability. All right, so that brings us to my favorite inshore spinning rod. But before we award the big championship ring to that rod series, let's get a quick recap of the other nine. All right, at number 10, we had Fenwick's HMG inshore spinning rod. At nine, Penn's Squadron 3 inshore spinning rod. At eight, we had St. Croix's Mojo inshore spinning rod. At seven, Shimano's Compre. At six, Ugly Sticks Carbon inshore. At five, Cast King's Estuary inshore rods. At four, Okuma's DTR custom inshore rods. At three, the Penn Battalion 2 inshore. And at number two, we had Daiwa's Saltus. And that brings us to the main event. And I want to give the number one position to a rod series that I fell in love with to the extent that I own and fish with more of these rods than any other series I have. So the number one inshore spinning rod for this week's Fishing Professor's Top 10 goes to the G. Loomis E6X inshore spinning rods. And yes, if you want to see the Inventive Fishing video gear review of these rods, you can find that video over on the Inventive Fishing YouTube channel. And if you don't already, you should subscribe to the Inventive Fishing YouTube channel for more reviews and other great information. Anyway, yes, I love my G. Loomis E6X inshore spinning rod and also my E6 casting rods. The spinning rods come in 11 different models, and yes, there are three casting models as well. These are really light, really strong, and the reason for that is that G. Loomis uses a multi-tapering approach to build their blanks. That tapering technology allows G. Loomis to create a series of rods that are really diverse in their casting and their strengths and in their actions. They come in 6'6 six, six models, 7-foot models, 7'6 seven, models, and 8-foot models. I will say, too, that I also have G. Loomis's IMX Pro Blue spinning rods, and I love them, too. But the E6X spinning rods are hand, hands down my favorite inshore spinning rods, and I would eagerly add more to my collection when I can. 
So those are my favorite inshore spinning rods. And of course, if you have rods you think I should take a look at, or if you're a manufacturer and you want to recommend other inshore spinning rods, please let me know. I'm always eager to try out new gear. And frankly, there are a lot of great rod companies out there whose rods I just haven't had the chance to use or I don't own, or I own versions of their rods that aren't inshore spinning rods. So if you have other rods you think I need to be looking at, or if you're a manufacturer and you want me to look at your stuff, you can always email me at sid at inventifishing.com or use the comment feature on whatever platform through which you access the Rodcast to let me know about those other rods. All right, reel them in. Let's move on. Eastbound down, loaded up and trucking. We gonna do what they say can't be done. We got a long way to go and a short time to get there. I'm eastbound, just watch old professor run. That's right, I'm out of here. We have come to the end of another great episode of the Rodcast, and it is quite often that when I am feeling good about wrapping up an episode, I just can't help but letting my inner Jerry read out. Because Lord, Mr. Ford, when you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. But Amos Moses says the alligator done bit it. Somebody stop that bird. Oh, what a great time today. I want to thank my pal Steve Griffin for that fun conversation. Griff, that was great. And I can't wait for us to get back on the water together again. Hard water or open water, I'm ready when you are. I do hope you all found my thoughts about Jack Daniels rye whiskey to be elucidative. And I hope that this week's top 10 countdown of my top 10 spinning rods for inshore applications was educational. Hey, before I sign off today, I do have a message for our brothers and sisters out there behind the line. The line is snagged. I say again, the line is snagged. And that just about does it for this week's episode of the Fishing Professor Rodcast. Hey, be sure to look for next week's episode, which will drop on Wednesday next week, as it does every week. And I hope that you and all of the members of the listening crew will spread the word about the Rodcast. Hey, you know what? In fact, the professor has homework assignment for you this week. Each one of you listening this week has to email or text or post in your social media the link to the Rodcast with a note telling whomever you're sending the link to that they really ought to be listening to the show. I will be checking your homework even if your dog eats it. So get at it, crew. And of course, if you have a comment or question about anything on this week's show or have recommendations for future top tens, bourbon breaks interviews, or information about specific fishing-related issues, please feel free to email me at sid at inventivefishing.com or leave a reply in any of the comment sections for any of the podcast platforms you use to listen to the Rodcast. Hey, you should also follow Inventive Fishing on Twitter, on Instagram, and friend us on Facebook at Inventive Fishing. And be sure to check out all of the great video content over on the Inventive Fishing YouTube channel, which includes great gear reviews, new product introductions, and a mess of other great fishing content. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, this is Sid Dobrin, the fishing professor. Fish on! The Fishing Professor Show is copyrighted by Inventive Fishing, LLC. Any rebroadcast of the podcast without the consent from Inventive Fishing, LLC is strictly prohibited. Fish on!